what is happening really is that medicine has stopped to be the art of medicine where doctors, nurses, and other health Care professionals were able to really center their passion and their, their skills on helping people, and it became a business to the point that the ones that run the healthcare system are not nurses, are not physicians, are not healthcare professionals, are business individuals that don't have the experience that we have. Welcome to Be Bold Branding where we discuss the power of differentiating yourself through your own unique story and standout personal brand. Since the pandemic, we have a public health crisis, which will probably not surprise any of you. Doctors, nurses, and other medical personnel are burned out, exhausted, and some are even unmotivated. Well, our guest today is on a mission to help with this critical issue. Dr. Miriam Zilberglate is a triple board certified physician in internal medicine, geriatrics, and obesity medicine, and the founder of Virtual Wellbeing MD. Her clinic offers comprehensive, holistic and personalized care to medical personnel using advanced technology and evidence-based medicine. Dr. Z, as she affectionately goes by, is also the author of the number one best-selling book, The 3G Cycle of Life, The Secrets for Achieving Joy, Meaning, and Well-Being. Let's find out how she's helping to address this huge issue impacting our healthcare providers today. Welcome to Be Bold Branding, Dr. Z. Thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. So uh, let's start like this. Let's go way back to maybe your childhood and where you grew up and how you grew up and what led you to be so passionate about this space that you're in. So I am a Latin girl. I grew up in Peru and I came here uh, 13 years ago following the love of my life, my husband. Uh, that's how I became an American uh, doctor. I went to medical school in Peru and I practiced for 10 years as a physician in the Navy, uh, which makes me very proud. And um, as a girl, uh, actually, I didn't want to be a doctor. I was absolutely terrified of needles and blood. Uh, still today, I don't like needles. <laughs> uh, but I wanted to save the world. That was my, you know, my dream. I will talk about saving the world, saving people, helping. And uh, I moved from being a diplomat, going around the, the different countries to being a psychologist until my best friend uh, who wanted to be a doctor this decided that to convince me that if I will be a psychologist, better to be a psychiatrist. Uh, we will go together to medical school. I will get more money as a, as a psychiatrist as a, than as a psychologist. And um, yeah, and I went with that crazy idea to my parents. And you just need to say no to an adolescent so that adolescent gets what she wants. And that's the reason why I went to medical school. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It was a happy mistake, I guess, or, you know, it was a, a crazy decision, but probably one of the best decisions that I took in my life. <laughs> that's cool. That, what oh, a, that's what, fascinating. What, what a great way to put it, too. And um, so humble, mm -hmm. you know, because although it might have been a mistake you started it, you still put in work and the effort to become it. So it's <laughs> you clearly have the, de the dedication <laughs> to the craft. Uh, in, uh, I believe that, that, that more than a mistake, the mistake will be not to be a doctor. I believe that uh, I was not emotionally uh, ready to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Uh, I used to cry with my patients, so it was very uh, funny to see me trying to help and the emotional aspect. Uh, I was very naive and I thought that justice and what is correct and, you know, kind people uh, is really on, on, on in charge of the world. And uh, sadly, I discovered through medicine that life was not so simple. And I went out of this bubble of, you know, the happy and perfect life uh, to discover that there was a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. Um, and that helped me to develop the skills that I have today that 
allowed me to help others. So for some reason, this was meant to be. <laughs> and yes. I am grateful that happened like that. Sometimes we need to open our minds and our hearts to the opportunities, right? And when opportunity knocks your door, my mom used to say that you just open, then figure it out, but you just open. <laughs> So great true. advice. Great advice. It is great advice. And so you you kind of led us into the next part of our conversation, as we alluded to in the opening, Dr. Z. Uh, we do have a healthcare crisis, a, a public health crisis in our world right now, not just in this country, but globally. So talk a little bit about what is happening in the healthcare world since the pandemic. I want to clarify that this is sadly not since the pandemic. I believe that the pandemic only opened as the window, so we are able to see what was happening behind the scenes. Um, and I, I appreciate the fact that you clarified that this is not just happening in the US. Actually, if we see the world, um, is really happening around. There are some countries like England and Australia that I know that they are at the high levels of uh, physician burnout and suicide like in our country, but but in, in reality it's affecting all of us around the world. And, and what is happening really is that medicine has stopped to be the art of medicine where doctors, nurses and other health their professionals were able to really center their passion and their, their skills on helping people, and it became a business. Uh, to the point that the ones that run the healthcare system are not nurses, are not physicians, are not healthcare professionals, are business individuals, right, that don't have the experience that we have. Uh, they know a lot of other things, right? And I applaud them for that. It's, it's great to know about business and marketing and, and, and you know, uh, the legal aspects of medicine. But, but when you never in your life gave a bad news to someone, when you never saw a mother losing her son in front of you, when you never saw someone losing their arms or the leg or not being able to walk again, when, when you didn't do resuscitation or you didn't sleep for 30 hours and you miss the birthday party of your kid or your mother, right? Or the wedding of someone that you love. It's, it's hard to understand what really is happening inside of the hospitals, inside of the life of doctors and nurses and, and you know, in mm -hmm. reality around the healthcare system. And when you have this gap between what is the reality and the real goals, and what the business says that has to happen, you really create something that we call moral injury. And you are actually affecting those that need to practice medicine uh, for the benefit of patients and not for the benefit of metrics or bank accounts. Mm -hmm. uh, as a mm -hmm. consequence, we have doctors, 65% of physicians uh, suffering from burnout. We have 400 physicians dying by suicide every year in the US. Uh, and this is before COVID. And we have around 60% of physicians that suffer from clinical symptoms of depression. And those are the ones that take decisions every day about if you are having a regular delivery or a C-section, if you are getting intubated and admitted to the ICU or going back home, if you have a heart surgery or not. So, when you have doctors that are sick, it's very hard to have patients that recover. Like what you're hearing? Hit that subscribe button and learn how you can change how you're seen and charge what you're worth. Mm. Oh, beautiful put. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. It, it, those are those are fascinating stats, uh, really. And, uh, you know, something that we most of us wouldn't recognize uh, without somebody like you pointing that out. And I couldn't agree with you more. Like the business of hospitals and uh, healthcare is uh, has to be fixed at some point. 
not our topic necessarily, but it's a great point for you to to point out. What where where are these doctors and nurses getting help now? Um, do they ha do they have to disclose they're getting counseling? Is there maybe I'm asking a lot of questions here, but is uh, is there an impetus for them not to disclose for fear that it will affect uh, their job? Like talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So. Um even this looks probably surprising for many doctors and nurses, we need to disclose if we have been in any type of counseling or treatment with a psychology, psychiatrist. This is part of the questions that are included in our medical license application or renewal and our jobs. This doesn't happen to majority of other professionals for sure. And this brings fear to any healthcare professional of retaliation, right? Because mm -hmm. if this is in your in, <laughs> in your document, so probably you may not be taken by the hospital or, or, or your license will not be renewed. This came with consequences uh, and the consequences are in different colors and flavors. You have the amount of doctors that are suffering, right? And, and that are, dying by suicide again 400 means one or two per day right uh, this is a this is an important number um and then you have those that are looking for help outside the you know the typical system and this could be outside of the country this could be uh in an anonymous way some companies or organizations were created especially during covid uh worldwide to give that option to physicians so they can talk to someone in an anonymous way and not being judged. Um, some organizations offer this help, you know, uh, but it's absolutely not anonymous. So nobody really will reach out to those, especially if they are part of your job environment. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you have those that are using mechanisms to cope that are not necessarily healthy, alcohol, drugs, um, which is, you know, a dangerous behavior that will bring more and more uh, negative outcomes, sadly. Uh, there is a sad story that I believe that at some time became a catalyst for change. That is the story of Dr. Lorna Brink. She was a physician uh, in New York. She was the chief of one of the emergencies during COVID. And sadly, she got COVID. And after that, she suffered from mental a mental condition. And she was so embarrassed of that, that she decided to took her own life. The brother-in-law who was a lawyer that has, who is a lawyer that has been involved in the healthcare system for a long time, um, Corey faced uh, with the family, decided to create an organization that is called Dr. Lorna Breen Foundation. And they actually, they noticed that this was not enough, that this was not enough to help. So they were, he actually created the first law for this country, in this country that was approved and signed a couple of years ago by Biden uh, to prevent burnout in healthcare professionals. Sadly, this will be, um, it has an expiration date on September this year. Uh, so now there are efforts to try to keep that law al alive. So again, more efforts to help physicians and, and healthcare professionals exist. Um, I, I feel, I feel disappointed saying this loud because you will think that this is an obvious, you know, law and an obvious um, obligation. But looks like sometimes common sense is not so common. Mm. Yeah, unfortunately. Say that again. Oh yes, absolutely. What can you do? Dr. Z, you and your staff, what can you do to help people in that position? In my personal life, if you want to call it, I, I, I don't know if I have a real separation between my personal and my professional life, for good or for bad. I am the same person with white coat or without it. Uh, I have, first of all, I, I, I started to take better care of myself because I have been one of the several victims of, of burnout. And I started to set some boundaries and I quit my job to find a job that was 
uh, more appropriate for me and my value. So, so uh, I feel like I started to lead by example, and and that's probably the most difficult part. Uh, has been painful <laughs> to admit that aloud. Um, the second aspect of this was to educate myself. Uh, being a doctor doesn't make us leaders or individuals that could be able to negotiate or that could be able to create a project or a program or to go out uh, and talk in podcasts, right? That's not our natural, uh, our natural skills as physicians. So I had to go out of my comfort zone and start pushing myself to learn things that I didn't know and train myself. Uh, Right now, I am a chief well-being officer, certified uh, chief well-being officer. Um, and with that, try to educate others and not only physicians, because this is not just about physicians and nurses, but the community has the right to know that this is happening because it's the community that one that is affected more than the physician per se. Because as a physician, more or less, we have the knowledge. But... If someone goes to a hospital today or to a clinic and they don't know what is happening and they don't understand why the doctor is so uh, uncomfortable, upset, maybe rude, maybe he's going so fast and furious over your treatment and, and, and you don't get it, you will think that this is personal or they don't like you and you are not able to understand that this doctor is not the one that makes the appointments, that selects how many minutes we'll spend with you, that has a decision about your treatment. That's that's the insurance <laughs> business, not ours, right? And you will not be able to advocate for yourself or for your loved ones. So I believe that educate others. And last but not least, um, I opened my clinic uh, in order to be able to provide care to the community in general, but especially to be open for doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals to have a concierge, non-insurance related practice where they can be seen, you know, with all the protection that they need and all the care that they need coming from another healthcare professional that actually has been in their shoes, that is in some way still in their shoes. And I am giving lectures around the country uh, in different type of uh, conferences and groups, trying to educate, again, the healthcare professionals and the community and to help them to feel that they are not alone, that this is not their fault, that this is actually, we are in some way victims with another strength inside of us to not be victimized and to be able to recover control of our life and our profession. Yeah, that, um, well, congratulations on that, first off. Yes. Um, and yeah. it, it is amazing, uh, actually, that we would, I think maybe as the populace, we just put doctors on a, on a, a pedestal higher uh, than, you know, than other professions because they've worked so hard to get to that, that it puts them in a position of having to be superhuman rather than just being human right with with a higher education and, and a craft it's a it's sort of a shame that it would stigmatize uh doctors to, to be able to go and have counsel for the things they see because you you guys in the medical profession see crazy things like you see like you named them at the beginning of the podcast like things that the rest of us hopefully never get to deal with right never have to deal with the deaths of loved ones and and uh trauma in and and things like that it is sort of it's terrible that we don't have a better fix and it's wonderful that you're trying to get that done absolutely what what is what is the 3g cycle of life uh, that you refer to in your book is that uh tell us about that a little bit yeah so i have been resilient all my life uh life has been full of challenges uh like for everyone else, I will say, I don't, again, I don't like to victimize myself, but I had to go through challenges again and again, including coming around my 40s to start from zero in another country, right, with another language, et cetera. But I, I have been always very resilient. I didn't even know that word or what it means and that I am different than others or uh, I just, that was my, you know, my modus operandi. Uh, but during COVID, uh, I realized that people were coming to me and asking me, well, how are you doing this? And what, how you keep going? And I will be like, I have no answer. It's like, it's not that normal. It's not how it goes. And I was not able to put it on words. Um, 
simultaneously the opportunity of writing a book came in front of me and I was looking for, okay, how I put those two things together. And what I discovered through some, you know, insight word, work is that I have a way to live my life that is clear. I, I always start with my first G that is goals. I, I just, I need to set a goal, a project, a mission, a dream, whatever you want to call it. And, and that's what, I used to start my, my processes in life. And then I continue with something that is, for me, so important. It's this fuel inside of you that keeps you moving, moving right? That is, that is great, right? And, and before I thought that that needs to come only from me, from inside, but truly I discovered, especially during COVID, that it could come from others, right? Your cheerleaders, your mentors, that people that will be like, yes, you can do it no matter what. We are here for you, right? And last but not least, in theory, I think that my cycles in life should close with, oh, I achieved my goal. But reality, uh, for good or for bad, is that not only in my life, but in the life of the majority, we not always achieve our goals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because we change our mind, right? And the guy that he was so handsome and you want to marry is, is not your type anymore, right? Or, <laughs> or the career that you wanted is not a good fit or whatever it is, right? Or, or you were not yet prepared for that position and now you need to study more and, and get another master so you can fit that place. Or you achieve it and then you discover, okay, great, amazing, right? I did it. But what will happen no matter what the scenario you choose is that if you have an open mind and an open heart, if you are humble, uh, you will learn from the experience and from the good ones and the bad ones. And that will allow you to get the third G, which is growth. So again, the cycles of life for me are composed by goals, greed, and growth. And when you close a cycle as a video game, you will start the next one being a better version of yourself and being more ready for the next, the next chapter of your life. Oh, I love that. I, yeah. I love the goals, <laughs> grit, and growth like a video game. Yeah. <laughs> when you close, when you, when you win one game, you just start over and start a different one. Love that concept. And we love what you are doing, Dr. Z. Uh, Thank it's, you. It, it's very <coughs> admirable, very much needed. And uh, as we come to a close, we have a final question for you, which is how can people get in touch with you if they need help or need some advice? Of course. First of all, thanks again for having me. And they can find me at www.virtualwellbeingmd.com. Uh, my email is drc at virtualwellbeingmd.com. And you can find me also at LinkedIn as Dr. C. That's awesome. We'll put those in the show notes. And thank you so much for coming on our podcast. And thank you uh, for what you're doing out there to make the world a better place. Thank you for allowing me to share. And if any of you watching me is going through a difficult time, uh, ask for help, allow people to help you. You don't need to go through this alone. Uh, your life is important. You are important. And um, love yourself. Uh, at the end, that's the most important thing. Take care of yourself. Ready to change how you're seen and charge what you're worth? If you're not getting enough opportunities to meet with ideal customers or the prospects you're meeting with just aren't ideal, it's most likely your brand that's holding you back. So if you're a coach, consultant, or expert who is on the rise, you need our ultimate guide to a freedom-based brand. Download it free now at brandfaceguide.com.